Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Seth Simmons, an information security engineer by day and Monero enthusiast by night. Seth has become a well-known and respected Monero supporter with popular tweet threads and a blog on things like Bitcoin's fungibility flaws and explaining developments in the Monero space. In this episode, Seth discusses his journey into the crypto space, why he decided privacy and fungibility are vital to cryptocurrency, and some of his most popular recent takes, like his opinion of Signal adding mobile coin. Monero Talk starts now. What's going on, man? Not much. It's been a, uh, a busy last couple of weeks in the cryptocurrency space. Busy last couple of months, I feel like. That's a couple of years, something, right? Something Jesus. brewing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. So uh, I've been trying to get you on for a while. Uh, I, I guess I don't know when I first started seeing you on the scene, but I, I don't think you, you haven't always been in the Monero world. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, okay. you're right. I'm, I'm not an OG, but I'm around, I guess. I'm getting to where I'm around longer than a lot of people, but uh, definitely yeah. I, I, I got in like 2018. So. Okay. Not, well, not you're, you're definitely a quick study because you certainly know your stuff. And so I've been following you on Twitter. You know, you have a lot to say. Um, you you seem to be really good at analyzing things and breaking things down to what matters most. So thanks for coming on the show, man. And thanks yeah. for uh, all you're doing for the Monero community. You're getting some good information out there. Yeah, glad to be here. So how did you, how did you get involved in 2018? What led you to Monero? Yeah, so I got into the cryptocurrency space like right at the top of the bull market, like right at the end of 2017, early 2018. So when BTC spiked and then alt started going crazy afterwards. Um, so 100% got into the space to make money. Um, wasn't really interested in the other use cases, didn't really see the need, I guess. Um, and I hadn't fallen down the privacy rabbit hole then either. So. Um, just kind of got into it for that. I got interested in mining just kind of as a, um, I'm in IT and I've always been technical and I like the concept of mining and wanted just the experience of building a mining rig. Um, and at that point, Monero was really the biggest thing to mine outside of Ethereum. Um, and Ethereum was just starting to become pretty unprofitable just because of how many people were mining it. So this was pre random X. So I built a GPU mining rig um, and that got me kind of it just into the community to mine and see how much I can make and just kind of as a an experience an experiment but um very quickly honestly it's the community is the only reason that I'm here and the only reason that I'm excited about privacy and advocating for privacy in general um because they really pulled me in a lot of people kind of took me under their wing and helped kind of educate me on why privacy matters both in cryptocurrency and just more broadly um a lot of people advocating for linux use and FOSS in general and um obviously monero too but that's kind of how i got how i got involved was right around that yeah, so you had a great write-up on privacy tools that people should be using. Obviously, I think you included Monero as one of those. Uh, you included Signal as well. We'll get to that. I'd love to talk to you about that. Yep. Um, so wait, but before, so you got, you know, you got in for the money, uh, which you know most people most people did, right? I think everybody did. Everybody that's kind of being honest with themselves. Um, were you looking at crypto before that? Were you, or you just were kind of ignoring it? So the only time I'd ever looked into crypto was uh, 2011 
I was in college and a friend of mine recommended we mine Bitcoin because we had free power uh, living on campus. And I looked into it, didn't really get the point and didn't really see the value. I ended up doing just like folding at home um, all day long on my my desktop, my just gaming desktop that I had in the dorm. Completely forgot about Bitcoin, didn't cross my mind, didn't run into anybody in real life that was interested or anything um, until 2017. And then when I guess Bitcoin started running like four or 5,000 and that Segwit 2X and all that fun stuff, um, some of my coworkers got, got me interested, just kind of throwing some money at different things and, and seeing what stuck. Um, so I definitely had a chance to get in before then, but it just never really, I didn't have anybody in my life that was pushing it at all. And none of the online circles I was in were really cryptocurrency focused. So what did, uh, what did you study in college? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, yeah. Data networking and security. Okay. Cyber, cybersecurity has been my focus mostly. You, is that your day? Is that your day job currently? Um, it was, I actually changed jobs recently. Uh, so I'm a site reliability engineer now. Um, so still it, but, um, Okay. So I imagine now the, those circles are talking about crypto, right? I mean, now it's it's pretty much impossible to ignore. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like during the 2017, 2018 bull run, my whole office was talking about it. And then no one survived that bull run. <laughs> like a couple people stayed semi-interested, but almost everybody ended up staying in too long, losing money and, and bailing and not being interested again. So that are was they, interesting. Are they back in again? Are they interested again? Nobody that I know of. I mean, I've, I've been I've been talking to those people like from, I mean, when Bitcoin was three thousand and crashed, everybody was like just making fun of me and joking about how how bad Bitcoin was and how glad they are they weren't investing. And I was like, I don't know. I think it's still I think it's a pretty great opportunity. Still pushing and pushing people into Monero and trying to explain the differences. And um, most of them just weren't really interested. They just saw it as a as a stock um, and thought. I have a 401k. I'll just sit on that and go the safer route, um, which obviously they missed out on financial gains. Um, and also, I think I've missed out on the, the bigger picture of what cryptocurrency can be as well. But my current office is definitely buzzing with talk of Bitcoin prices. So it's been a good been a good entry. Do you interject with Monero, I'm sure? Is there uh, what, what do people think of Monero in, in your day to day? I'm I'm working it in there. Um, my my profile picture for like all of my work accounts is uh, the Monero logo from DEF CON a couple years ago. It's the same one I use on Twitter. So um, that sparked some some conversations and, um, and t- telling people about how I'm mining and uh, that kind of thing. So I've been working it into conversations. Again, most of them are really interested in the the number go up side of things. Um, so yeah. I'm trying to work on them. But there's there's quite a few who are very focused on. Um, free open source software and like very interested in that. So I'm kind of trying to spend that angle of how Monero is an open source project that is completely decentralized. There's no central person. People are just contributing of their own free will, that kind of thing. So been some good angles. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I mean, the people that I was telling, uh, talking to about Bitcoin many years ago, you know, before uh, it was a mainstream thing. Yep. They looked at me with, you know, two heads like, okay, <laughs> okay, guy, whatever. Uh, and now, you know, those same people are like, oh, wow, Bitcoin. And, you know, now I tell them, well, actually, Monero is what I finally arrived at in terms of my, and they're like, wait, what? And, you know, but now it's the same thing. Two heads looking at me and they're like, I don't get it. I'm like, yep. well, well, now you seem to, you claim to have gotten Bitcoin. Why don't you get this? So they're like, you know, the, but it's worth $60,000. Monero is <laughs> only worth, you know, $200. So it can't be nearly as good. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. There's just certain types of people that can't understand something until it's too late. It seems. I think too. I mean, I think it's it's part of just being spoiled to be in a a pretty free, pretty rich first world country. I mean, we're in a very different situation here. I know we're both in the U.S. and I think people just haven't seen the need yet because generally we've had quite good freedoms compared to most of the world, um, and generally have. I mean, we're one of the richest countries in the world and have been for a very, very long time. So I think people haven't seen the two main use cases of cryptocurrency as a need. It's just more right now it's a, oh, there's this other thing that I can put money into and hope I end up with more money at the end. So I think that will start changing as um, surveillance and specifically financial surveillance keep uh, cranking up. Um, and just as economic policies and inflation start to 
start to take effect after all this. So I think we'll see more people kind of come around to, oh, there's actually another side to this. Um, but right now it's just, it's another riskier stock. It's just kind of a penny stock to people, I feel like. Yeah, I think COVID definitely accelerated things, right? Mm -hmm. So like you said, the money printing. Um, and then, yeah, there's been a lot of, I think, big events that opened people's eyes to uh, these concepts of surveillance um and these concepts of technology companies being in complete control of a, a lot of our freedoms and our data yep. you know the deplatforming of, of uh our past president i mean those things i think did open people's eyes but yeah Absolutely. you're right it's not really hitting people home uh and unfortunately i think for a lot of people it's not it's not going to hit home until like it literally affects their personal life yeah um how do you, so do you see Monero, obviously the privacy, um, but do you also on a fundamental like technological level, because I always talk about like fungibility, right? So how, I, you know, Bitcoin lacks fungibility, Monero appears not to, it appears to be a lot better, appears to be resistant to being tainted. Um, do you see that? So in addition to that, obviously protecting people's privacy, do you also see that as being essential to this technology working like the one that has fungibility has a technological advantage do you look at it that way yeah i definitely do i mean the the common disclaimer of the best technology has not always won um there have been lots of technological battles where the thing that is clearly the better option has lost out due to marketing or um, properly driving adoption that kind of thing so I don't think that it's always a the best technology wins, um, but I think that I think that the important thing to keep in mind is that Bitcoin has done a great job of spinning the narrative that it is fungible and that it's a store of value. Um, and even there, there's still parts of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin community, that talk about how it, it's a good uh, method of exchange. Those parts are really, I think, dying out mostly outside of the Lightning camp, um, and I have a lot of opinions about whether or not lightning is the right solution moving forward. But um, I think they've done a good job of spinning that narrative enough so that people aren't really thinking about the technological flaws. Um, and that's something I've been trying to, to focus on because especially fungibility is something that is core to any money. I mean, it, it can't really be sound money in my opinion, unless you have fungibility because you always have to be worrying about how you're using it, how you're spending it, where you got it from. Um, and it could also lose store value properties as well if it's not fungible, because maybe you have Bitcoin that's not tainted today, but maybe 10 years down the line, they decide, oh, anybody who bought Bitcoin at a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, right now that's fine, right now you can use it how you will, but maybe in 10 years, people who bought it via peer-to-peer -peer exchange, oh, you can't sell that via any normal um, on-ramp or off-ramp. You can't sell that at any exchange, or you can sell it, but someone in a black OTC market will buy it for 10 cents on the dollar or something because they know they can still use it, but it's not the store of value. So I think that that technological gap is something that um, I've been trying to highlight lately. I mean, it's an issue for all cryptocurrencies because the hard thing is these these monies that we're building have to be digital. I mean, that's that's what gives them value is it's a way that you can transact and store value digitally. And when you do anything digitally, it becomes incredibly difficult to protect privacy and metadata leakage. Um, and when you add on top of that, you have to be able to validate the supply, you have to be able to validate that no one's double spending funds. You have to publish certain amounts of information to a public blockchain for the money to work. Um, and obviously Bitcoin did that in a way that worked for back then. I feel like in just talking to people, one of the reasons that Satoshi maybe didn't build in stronger privacy. It was either A, he just didn't know how, um, which seems quite plausible from reading through like his posts on Bitcoin talk, that kind of thing. Um, he hinted at a lot of the features that Monero has now. Um, and then I think the other reason was if, if Satoshi had introduced Monero initially, it would have been a really hard sell because it's you can't see what's going on. Like you, you pull up a Bitcoin Explorer, it's really easy to explain to people like here, you can audit the supply this way. You can clearly see this transaction spends 10 Bitcoin. Everything's very simple. It's not simple, but it's simpler to explain at least and to to get across as a 
a stable system to people when it's a completely new technology. I mean, or it's a completely new way to use blockchain technology. Um, and I think that was important then, but what we've seen very clearly, and I've been kind of cataloging this on a, a post on my site, is Bitcoin has a serious technological flaw, which is that it is not fungible. Every Bitcoin UTXO has a history. Um, you can obfuscate that history by coin joining or some other techniques. Coin join is really the only approachable one right now. Um, and if you do that, great, you hide the previous history, but now your UTXO has the history that it has been coin joined. Um, and you can never actually erase the history. You can just obfuscate it and give it a different history. Um, and so I've cataloged a list of issues on my site where this is affecting real people. I think it's it's helpful for people to see this isn't just some kind of, oh, there's gonna be this problem in 20 years. It's There's a problem right now and people who are unsuspecting and who are not doing anything wrong are being affected by a technological flaw that can be fixed and is already fixed in Monero. Um, and I like to remind people too that the tech that Monero uses, a lot of it was proposed to be implemented on Bitcoin. And then Bitcoiners for one reason or another either just shut it down and said, no, we don't want that or they just forgot about it and didn't implement it. Um, most of it, they just decided not to implement it. And the, that technological flaw hurts real people. And we're only on the very cusp of that happening. I mean, this is the beginning of all of that as chain analysis companies are starting to figure out, hey, we can make a lot of money by telling governments and regulators and businesses that these outputs are tainted and these aren't. Um, and that that business only exists because of a technological flaw that can be solved today, so. I obviously agree with everything you're saying here. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, the, the, the issue is uh, there's the BTC maxis that just, you know, uh, refuse to see things this way, even though they're basically, for all the reasons they like Bitcoin, they should equally like Monero, if not more, right? So we saw like uh, that guy, Robert Breedlove was tweeting today. That was like a big tweet that was put out there. Um, and... What was he asking? Oh, is Monero sufficiently decentralized? But before even getting to that, just uh, I, you know, I've watched some of his stuff after seeing that because I had seen him around. But I'm like, let me let me take a closer look at this guy. I was watching some of his YouTube videos, and like his real thing is just talking about gold and how Bitcoin is digital gold and making these comparisons and saying, you know, you have the the five elements that make money money, and you know, he goes durability and scarcity and divisibility but like i never hear him say the word fungibility and i just don't know how that like is not a critical aspect of money and of you know gold i mean how do you i don't even know how you make that mental contortion and you sit there and then you look at something uh like monero which fixed this flaw yet you just overlook it what do you what do you think is going on is it just as simple as that you know they're, they're bag holders and uh it's the number go up has has hypnotized them to a degree what do you or do you think they really have some validity to their arguments and not really con being concerned so much about the degree of fungibility that that bitcoin has versus monero yeah i think there's i think there's several camps i think there's some people who are very genuinely see the fungibility issue, but they they think that there are ways that they can build apps on top of Bitcoin that will solve it. Um, and I can I can sympathize with that view. I obviously disagree, otherwise I probably wouldn't be working on Monero and spending all this time on Monero. Um, but I think that's a valid viewpoint. People are, the people who believe that are generally people who entered into Bitcoin and want to see the method of exchange use case for Bitcoin survive. Um, and I 100% support those people. I think they're doing good work, like the Samurai Wallet team, doing really cool things, trying to bring necessary fungibility and privacy to Bitcoin. Um, something I've harped on is those tools can't bring fungibility to Bitcoin. They can bring privacy to specific users, but they can't actually bring fungibility. Um, but I think the other side of things is that we don't really worry about fungibility in regular life, in fiat life. I mean, you don't, you don't ever have to think about is this dollar tainted or is this is this hundred dollars that I'm sending for my checking account tainted or is my credit card tainted? Like you know, you don't need to worry about that in normal life. So I think this concept of fungibility is one that people aren't 
familiar with. So they just don't, they don't think about it. Um, and that's totally understandable. I think if, if you haven't considered the concept, you haven't heard like why fungibility matters, um, that's understandable, but the thing that but the changes, BTC Max are, are, are thinking about it. They're they're yeah. aware of it. You know, yeah, like, we, there are many we had Peter McCormick on this show. I'm sure you saw that one with Peter McCormick. Like, I, I know he's not. He claims that he's not. Uh, you know, he doesn't have technological understanding of things. But he, I mean, he's he's around Bitcoin literally every day, 24 seven, talking to the you know most intelligent minds in the space. And yet he claimed to have just kind of realized that, you know, Bitcoin has a fungibility issue. Yeah. Like, yeah. so, I mean, they're, you know, this guy Breedlove, he analyzes it every day, compares it to gold, yet he overlooks the fungibility issue. So I yeah, get what you're I saying. Mean, there think, are, there are those the, that camps are that there are, there are people who 100% yeah, are, they're bag holders. They bought into Bitcoin, they want to see fiat gains, they want to get out of Bitcoin eventually and make more dollars that they can spend on whatever they want. And they don't really care about the other use cases. They care about number go up and they want to see number go up and they don't really care if there's a fungibility issue. Because if you're okay with the regulated system and with complying and with doing everything that the government asks you to do, which in some countries you may be okay with, in some countries that could be a big problem, um, if you're okay with that forever, you don't really care that it's a fungibility problem because you're just going to make sure that you do everything the way that you're told and you're going to only use clean exchanges and you're never going to coin join and you're you're going to just throw all your, your Bitcoin out of Coinbase maybe onto a ledger if you're pretty advanced and you're just going to sit on it and you're hoping in 50 years you can sell it off and be wealthy or five years or 10 years. So there's that camp that just doesn't care. Um, I think there's also the camp that knows about the issue knows that the solutions that are being proposed probably aren't going to fix it, but are just attached to Bitcoin and are going to ride or die with it. Um, I mean, we've kind of merged religion and money when it comes to cryptocurrency. So we get some very, very cult-like behavior all throughout. And I mean, this isn't, it's not exclusive to Bitcoin. We've seen it with shield armies of every different small coin. And I mean, we see it some in Monero too, although I don't think very often yet, but I think that a lot of that is just because Monero is relatively small. But um, when you merge something like greed and religion and close community, which is a lot of what happens, it, it gets to where people are just honestly blind to the truth and don't want to see the truth. So. Those people, I mean, you try to share resources. If they're not going to see reason, they're not going to see reason. But I think there are a lot of people who mean well are sticking with Bitcoin because they hope that the problems can be solved in layer two or in wallets or something like that. Um, and I can, I can sympathize with that. But obviously, I, I don't see that happening for Bitcoin. It's very clear that the base layer is not going to change in any drastic ways. Um, and I don't think that layers built on top of a non-fungible and transparent base layer are going to be usable. How about the uh, the network effect argument? So those who are even like, all right, well, Monero is great. Too bad it wasn't the first uh, because, you know, and since it's not, it's basically trending to zero against Bitcoin and it's never going to go anywhere. Well, what's your response to that? I mean, the simplest one is if you think Monero is the better tool and you think network effect is the only issue, just start using Monero and start telling people about Monero. I mean, you can change the network effect. Network effect is not something that is this unstoppable snowball. It's something that happens because people see something, they appreciate it, and they decide to invest time, money, and energy into it. And they spend time talking to others about it and engaging with their local communities, that kind of thing. So, I mean, if we had big Bitcoiners who are very pro-privacy just say, hey, like, I've tried Bitcoin privacy. I don't see it working. Monero is the way forward. I'm going to start working on Monero and trying to help educate people with that. Guess what? A lot of their followers are going to switch. A lot of people are cult-like followers of <laughs> Twitter personalities, or they very legitimately have a lot of trust and faith in the things that they're being told. So if their favorite Bitcoiners start saying, hey, I think, I think Monero is actually what we need here, people are going to follow them and network effect is going to reverse and network effect is going to switch to Monero. And then you have the better tool and you have network effect rolling for it. So, I mean, yes, network effect is extremely strong. And I think if Monero fails to become a more broadly used tool, it will probably be just because of network effect. Um, but that's not something that's unchangeable. And if people really think it's the best tool, they shouldn't just say, ah, oh, it's a shame there's, there's no network effect for Monero. 
they can make it happen. Yeah, the, I mean, the other thing you hear some of these, some of the bigger guys in Bitcoin, uh, respected guys are like, you know, I think Andreas even made a Monero comment recently, and he's made plenty in the past. We had him on this show. I don't know if you ever saw that episode. That was a good one. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it basically boiled down to kind of the use Monero if you need it to use it, but it's, you know, not an investment like uh, Bitcoin is digital gold. And if you need to use Monero, use Monero. What's your response to that? Because I don't really understand that take either. It's kind of like uh, Monero only, you know, use it if you have some need for digital cash. But other than that, it's not worth. But isn't it going to have to have a lot of value if it's going to be usable for those purposes? Right. Like that, that's that's the what I'm struggling to to understand when people say, uh, well, I'm going to keep my Bitcoin, but I'm just going to use Monero when I need to. Aren't you kind of admitting that Monero is usable and needed? And because of that, it's going to have to have a market cap of much larger than it is today. Otherwise, how would you even be able to use it? Like, let's say, well, I wanted to use it to send, uh, you know, $10 million tomorrow or, you know, $100 million. It's not going to be usable for those purposes if the market cap isn't large enough. How, how do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I mean, just from personal experience, I, I'm in quite a few Bitcoin circles, especially those that are focused on privacy and actually using Bitcoin as digital cash. Um, and just from the personal experience of interacting with those people, once they start down that path of saying, like, I like Bitcoin, I wish it was easier to use privately, I'm just going to start, I'm just going to swap some into Monero, and I'm just going to start using that and see how it goes. Those people inevitably end up going either completely into Monero, because they realize, oh, I can have something I can hold as a store of value, and I can just spin out of it without all of the concerns and fees and issues. Um, or they stay at this place, which I think is another view I can sympathize with and makes sense of Bitcoin is this checking is the savings account and Monero is a checking account. So I keep amounts in Monero that I'm going to need to use regularly and I'm going to keep money in Bitcoin that I want to save over the long term. Um, and I definitely I disagree with that view. Monero is just as good, if not better, of a store of value as Bitcoin and has performed extremely well over the history of Monero. Um, but I can understand that view because Bitcoin obviously has done incredibly well from a, a savings perspective over its lifetime. Um, so saving money in that, and especially once we have atomic swaps so that you can trustlessly go between Bitcoin and Monero, I think it really opens up that use case for people as well. Um, but I think once people start realizing, I don't actually want to use Bitcoin because it's a privacy nightmare. It's a fungibility nightmare. It costs me so much money to transact, especially if I want to transact privately. They they start using Monero and they realize how powerful of a tool it is and how it's just it's better to use and it's better to even keep value in because you don't have to worry about people spying on how much you own or keeping an eye on your outputs, that kind of thing. Um, so I think people inevitably go that way usually. But I think we've I think a lot of people that we see as like dabbling their toe in Monero are probably a lot deeper in Monero than we realize, especially big names like Andreas. Um, but I can't really speak for them. But. Well, Andreas famously like didn't buy any Monero ever. And remember until <laughs> whatever it was, 2018, when people had to give it to him, uh, he was out there talking about it. Uh, you know, all the credit in the world. He's he's really done a great job in in explaining Bitcoin and spreading it. But that that was that was hard to believe that he then really never acquired it. Um, so who knows? Maybe he uh, well maybe he learned his lesson this go around. Um, so your your blog is awesome, and yeah that 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 blog that you have particularly on um, how essentially Bitcoin is infungible and you're giving all these examples that have happened to date. What do you think is kind of the, one of the most damning examples of uh, Bitcoin's lack of fungibility to date? I think the biggest one that we've already seen have a real world impact is just people constantly being blocked from depositing funds in exchanges or withdrawing funds from exchanges when trying to coin join. Yeah, I think the regulators and governments have started to realize 
we're fine with Bitcoin as long as it fits within our system. We're fine with it as long as people use it on exchanges where we have KYC AML and we can watch everything people are doing. And we're fine with it if people just use regular transactions and don't coin join. But the thing that worries them is that if a lot of people use coin join on Bitcoin, that would cause a lot of problems for other analysis as well. Um, I don't think that will ever happen, but an easy way to prevent that is just say, hey, if you want to get in or out of Bitcoin from fiat, you can't do any of these lists of things. Um, and coin join is one where specifically with Wasabi wallet, but we've also had a couple um, issues with Samurai wallet users being blocked or having their funds returned to them, which was interesting. Um, I think that's the most damning one right now, but I think the the kind of coming storm around fungibility is one I've been talking about for a while, and there's, there's two really good articles. Um, they're linked at the bottom of my fungibility graveyard post on my blog, um, but they're by, I'm going to butcher this name, but Juraj Bednar. Um, hopefully I said that right. But, yes. uh, yeah, yeah, that's a great article. I yeah. think I found it through you on your tweets. Yeah, he has two excellent articles that really describe in detail how the flaw of fungibility and privacy within Bitcoin, how difficult those are to actually achieve or impossible they are to achieve, can lead to some really fascinating mining attacks. Um, and recently, we've already seen, I think it was last year, the first pool announced that they were going to be a compliant pool. And they were basically, anybody who wanted to mine on that pool was only going to mine transactions that were approved. And normally that just means like not mining sanctioned address transactions and um, that kind of thing. It's It normally hasn't gone past that yet, but we also had what was a much bigger deal is just recently, I think it was two or three weeks ago. Um, let me just get the name real quick. Um, Marathon Digital Holdings mm -hmm. decided to switch over their existing pool to a compliant, a compliant mining pool. And that's a very big deal because if a new pool wants to start up and wants to be a compliant mining pool, it's gonna be really hard for them to pull in new miners. Um, there will be some who can who will switch if they get pressured by regulators or, gov or governments, that kind of thing. But it's really hard as a, a new pool in Bitcoin to acquire a lot of hash rate and have an impact on the network. But a pool like the one that's switching over now is the seventh largest pool in the world and they're switching all of their miners over by default to be a compliant mining pool. So now they're not going to be by, be mining any transactions that they deem or the government's deem to be tainted or have issues or have a bad history. And you start to see these issues where not only do people who want to interact with the outside world, outside of Bitcoin and outside of the Bitcoin network have issues, which we've seen for a while, but now you're also going to start seeing people unable to interact within the Bitcoin world. Because now if you send a transaction that they don't like, they're going to be able to censor it at the Bitcoin network level, which is a much, much bigger deal because that breaks so many of the guarantees that Bitcoin is supposed to have. I mean, one of the selling points of Bitcoin is that it's censorship resistant. And yet because privacy and fungibility have not been a priority and the technological means that we have today haven't been implemented, we're going to see more and more of this happen. Um, and especially these mining pools and mining attacks um, could be, I mean, they could be completely destructive to any use case of Bitcoin that doesn't fit perfectly within the, the legacy system. So. Yeah. And I think one of the points that, because then the argument becomes, well, a, a, you know, another mining pool would pick up that transaction, right? But then I guess what one of the points that Bednar makes is that, it, that would start to become too risky, right? They wouldn't want to, other pools wouldn't want to take that risk. Yeah, right? yeah. Huh? Something that people I think often don't realize about mining is that it's not just a bunch of altruistic miners who want to see Bitcoin succeed as a network. These mining and just, hey, if we lose money, we lose money, it's fine. That's not the people mining Bitcoin for the most part. There are people mining it like that, and there are going to be altruistic miners and pools that will do the right thing no matter what. And that's great. I, I wish that was the majority of the network. But the majority of the Bitcoin network are large corporate miners who have bills to pay. They have investors to repay. They have um, maybe stock investors to repay for some of the bigger ones. There's there's some very big miners who their, their number one priority is making more money. They don't care about how the Bitcoin network works as long as it doesn't threaten the overall money that they can make from the network. So if the, ch the choices are, 
cave in to a compliant mining pool and become a miner who only mines transactions that are sanctioned or that are allowed um, or switch to a smaller pool, which that would be generally the least of the problems. But switching to a smaller pool, they get a lot more variance in the payouts that they get. So they are a lot more at risk for not getting the Bitcoin when they need it so that they can sell and pay their bills. They're going to have issues with periods of time where they're not making enough, that kind of thing. So they have that initial issue. Um, but the other problem would be, as Bednar proposes in this, this set of articles, is if enough of the network, and it doesn't have to be 51%, which is the commonly cited amount, um, it can be a much smaller portion. If enough of the network decides, not only are we not going to mine transactions that we don't like, we're also not going to mine on top of blocks that include transactions that we don't like. So when these altruistic miners or these pools that just haven't gone compliant because they haven't enforced or they don't care, when they mine a block and they finally succeed and they mine one, even though they're not the majority of the network, then the rest of the network, whether it's, I think he starts at 10% and goes up to 51%. I can't remember the exact numbers, so I may be misquoting that. But if a, a relatively large portion of the network decides we're not going to mine on top of blocks that aren't compliant anymore, you're going to start see start seeing small miners and small pools mining blocks that then get orphaned, so they get no reward. So when you have an orphan block and you're a miner, what it means is that you put in all of this effort, you mined a block that was valid and attached to the chain, but then it gets dropped and you get no reward from it. So all of the work that you just put, put forth ends up being completely pointless. You get no reward, you get no money. So eventually, if this attack does happen and does sustain, all of the altruistic miners will just have to quit or they'll just have to burn money forever on electricity, um, which they could do for some time. But no one who wants to make money is going to continue to be a, be a non-compliant miner. So I would definitely recommend people read those articles. They go much more in depth, and I'm certainly not an expert on that. But there are some very, very interesting attacks that can happen. And these things can only happen because you can tell the history of a, of a UTXO on Bitcoin. If that wasn't possible, like in Monero, you can't have these attacks because no one can say, hey, we don't like this transaction. We don't like what you've done with it we're not going to mine that because there's no way to tell the transactions apart. They can either mine nothing, so they can mine empty blocks, which is a form of attack, or they can just mine everything. There's no in-between with a system like Monero. Um, so it's important for people to realize that it's it's because of a technological flaw that that can be exploited by governments and nation states and regulators. Yeah, great explanation of that, by the way. Yeah, I'm going to try to get him on the show. Would love yeah. to... Uh pick his brain further on that did you watch the peter todd episode we did i mean that i haven't had, had much time to listen to podcasts lately so i am okay. very very behind i have a ton of episodes downloaded and i just i haven't been able to get to well whatever you're doing episode. you're doing it right you're, you're getting the information somewhere so um i mean basically what i tried to make the theme of that was talking about bitcoin security versus moneros because that's that's really one of the major right differences and arguments between the two like yeah. well bitcoin focuses on security all its design decisions are based on you know security that's why uh you know they make sure to always make sure it's perfectly audible and easily audible you know all those things yet i do think there's a lot of ways in which monero may be more you know, arguably more secure than Bitcoin, this being one example of them, right? So the fact that, you know, you wouldn't be able to have a compliant mining pool in Monero land, but in Bitcoin, you can. So do you look at the two coins that way? Do you have kind of an overall assessment in your mind of which one is more secure when you look at these different factors? Another factor being, let's say, the tail emission. So I kind of, I tried going through these with Peter. Uh, you know, so um, and 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 tail emission is one of those where he actually you know agrees and thinks yes that gives yeah. you know a, a plus for for Monero there because it you know guarantees mining security into into the future. Um, what is your assessment of that when you when you look at security of, of the two coins? Yeah, um, first off, it's a that's a really tricky topic. I mean, security is a very 
a very loosely defined term and it's one that means something to different people. I mean, for mm -hmm. some people, security just means I need to be able to do napkin math to audit the supply. And if I can do that, that's secure. Some people, that means I need a coin that I can transact without censorship when nation states are after me. That's secure to them. So I think there's a lot of kind of moving targets. I think if we're talking about general mining security today, I would say Bitcoin is more secure in some ways than Monero because there's obviously drastically more hash rate, more miners. Um, it's harder to procure hash rate for Bitcoin because ASICs are restricted and limited and hard to acquire. Um, so there's some advantages there, but that also that reliance on ASICs and on large miners opens up a lot of these vectors that we've talked about here. And it also opens up other attacks like states taking over mining pools within their borders to attack Bitcoin, that kind of thing. Um, so I would say if you're just talking like hash rate security, Bitcoin's probably more secure. But right. But ha hash, like you're saying, I mean, hash rate security doesn't necessarily mean it's more secure, right? Because if hash yeah. rate security is being performed by t 10 companies and, you know, eight of them are in China, um, you know, how, how granted, yes, there might be a lot of jewels and power going into securing the chain. But if you can contact these companies or somehow influence them, then all that security goes out the door. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why I would say that Bitcoin's long term security is very much at risk. There's a lot of different attacks that can be done or are being done um, and a lot of different ways that the legacy system and governments will try to co-opt Bitcoin. Um, obviously, I, I'm in Monero. I work on Monero. I contribute to Monero. I educate about Monero. So the reasons that I'm here, many of them are that I see the design decisions that have been made in Monero. I see the reason behind them. And people, I think, for some reason, Bitcoiners are perpetuating this idea, or some Bitcoiners, not all of them, are perpetuating this idea that Monero is just kind of like loosey-goosey with design decisions and tech and that we just kind of implement things without a thought about security. And that is very much not the case. Monero is hyper-focused on security and the ways that we see security needing to be implemented are just different than Bitcoin in a lot of ways. Some of those are that we see that the security of the system as a whole is highly dependent on privacy being central and privacy being by default for all users. So we see that there are many attacks that can happen if privacy and fungibility aren't nailed down on the base layer and good to go. So we've implemented things that Bitcoiners, I mean, honestly, Monero is, is very cautious and slow about the way that it implements things. If there's an improvement to the base layer, to the protocols that we have in Monero, we make sure we get it audited multiple times. We make sure that it's very vetted from research community and an implementation standpoint. Um, a lot of the things that we've implemented were proposed many years ago for Bitcoin and have gone through lots of peer review and have gone through lots of um, analysis. So uh, Monero is very cautious and very focused on security. We just obviously have a different perspective on what that actually means and what's necessary, what's necessary to achieve that. Um, and some of the things that are necessary are, like you mentioned, the tail emission. I think we see that a purely fee-driven security model long-term will go one of two ways. It'll either become insecure and vulnerable to attacks because people won't want to pay the fees that are necessary to secure the network, or it'll become so costly that only wealthy people or corporations will be able to transact on the base layer, and it won't be actually usable for what it's designed for. Um, and obviously, so Monero implements this tail emission that, yes, it introduces some known and predictable inflation over the long term, but it's for a very clear reason, and that's bringing security to the chain. Um, so I think I obviously think that the design decisions made in Monero will make it more secure over the long term. I think arguing security between Bitcoin and Monero right now is a little bit more nuanced and difficult because in some ways Monero is just it's small compared to Bitcoin. It's a small community. It's a small group of miners in some ways. I mean, like I've, it's been interesting to watch the miner count just go through the roof um, over, over the, the last, last few, few months. months. And we started, I think I saw Howard tweeted that we had 40,000 miners a year and a half ago and we have 90,000 miners on the network today. Um, so I think we're seeing that like random X, we've made this very clear design decision 
and I say we, but I wasn't involved in that. Um, but Monero as a community has made this very clear design decision that we want people to be able to mine with the hardware that they already own. We don't want people to have to rely on some foundry in China or some foundry maybe in the US. I don't think there are any ASIC manufacturers in the US yet, but we don't want them to rely on a single source for the hardware that they can only use to mine Monero. We want them to be able to say, hey, I've got this gaming desktop that I use and I use it for other stuff, but I mean, I'm, I'm working eight, 10 hours a day. What can I do with it while I'm working? Oh, I can just run XM rig and I can mine Monero and watch Monero flow into my wallet and I can be a part of securing the network and I don't have to have some special hardware. Um, and that provides more protection against other attacks like we've seen in, I believe it was Venezuela where they were confiscating ASICs that were trying to be imported. For a country to confiscate computers, that would be a very big deal. And that would be something that would be pushed back on by many human rights uh, groups and countries across the world because restricting access to computers or the internet is a massive deal these days. But just stopping people from importing Bitcoin ASICs is pretty straightforward. It's easy to do, and there's not gonna be much pushback from that. So I think, yeah, Monero has made very conscious design decisions that we view as bringing long-term security. Um, and a lot of those are ones that have been proposed for Bitcoin or have been tried by other chains. And Monero's worked very hard to find implementations that work today and help secure the future of Monero long term. Random X is one of the things that I brought up to Peter Todd. Surprised to learn he had never heard of Random X. He didn't know it was a thing that Monero was doing. Uh, apparently, I did a bad job at describing Random X because I got a lot of flack from the community for that. And I'm not going to try. I mean, the, I, I basically boil it down to Random X turns, you know, the CPU. The CPU is the ASIC of Monero with Random X, right? So, yeah. um, Beyond that, you know, I, I'm not computer savvy enough to get into the technicalities as to why, you know, uh, a computer becomes the most efficient way of mining Monero. Um, but do you ultimately think that, you know, so RandomX appears to be working? Um, there was a lot, you know, there's a lot of debate in the community as to whether or not that was the right direction to go. This argument being that ultimately, ASICs will always, you know, find their way and somebody will figure out how to develop something in terms of hardware that will give them an advantage over others. How do you view that? Do you, um, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that RandomX is just, it's masterfully engineered from everything that I can tell. I mean, I'm not a hardware engineer. I've dabbled in a bit of that and I'm, I like to keep up with specifically like CPU releases and basic architecture, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm I'm somewhat versed in the rough pieces of CPU architecture and design, but definitely not to the level to be able to design something like this or even fully understand how it works. But in seeing the thought process that's got, that's got into it and in seeing the um, effectiveness and the initial very good reviews, I mean, we had what, four audits, five audits on RandomX before we implemented it? I think it was four, um, all the way from looking at the general idea, the actual code implementation, and having um, hardware and manufacturer try to figure out a way to build an ASIC against it. We did a lot of work and put a lot of money into making sure that it was secure. Um, and I mean, we've been, what, a year and a half now, I think, since we implemented RandomX? And, and that is an eternity in the cryptocurrency space, especially for ASIC resistance. Um, I mean, we had struggled to go for more than 68 months at a time without having an ASIC built against Monero's previously ASIC resistant algorithms. And they were good algorithms, but they just weren't quite right. Um, so RandomX ended up being like, this is the last attempt. Like if we can't figure it out this time, we're just gonna have to cave in and figure out how to do ASICs was a lot of the communities kind of view of it um, and it seems to be working really well so far it's brilliantly designed to make sure that yes someone could build an asic against random x but it's going to be so inefficient compared to it that it's not going to be worth the r d time and they're not going to be able to gain enough optimizations to make it worth the investment and that's really the key it's not it's accepting the fact that you can always build an asic for any kind of process like this even something that's incredibly complex like random x which has randomly iterating types of computation to make sure that you need the majority of the hardware that's within the CPU's architecture. 
even with that, you can still build an ASIC and chop out a couple extra pieces, but you're not going to be able to get something that's so incredibly efficient and so incredibly performant compared to a CPU that it's worth it in the long run and that you have a significant advantage. Um, and yeah, I think it's been really cool to see that it's working well so far. It's really, it's the last hope for ASIC resistance in the cryptocurrency space. I mean, there's also Prog POW, which has been up in the air for a long time. Um, Ethereum is not going to implement it, I don't think, because they're moving to ETH 2.0. Um, and I think some smaller chains might. So that, there's a chance that that could be ASIC resistant. That's a GPU focused algorithm. But um, I've heard some pros and cons to it that may or may not make it viable in the future. But I'm, I'm curious to see if a larger chain implements that and is able to, to keep it going. But RandomX has worked well. It ensures that regular people like me can mine. I've been able to get so many people into Monero just through mining. And once they see the power of mining and they see Monero in their wallet and they see how they can send it to me and I can send it to them and you can't see anything on a block explorer. There's there's so many ways that like mining is a great entrance too. And that's how I got into Monero um, pre random X, but it's, it's a great way to not only get people engaged in the community, but it also helps to make sure that there's not these 10 giant mining pools that control, um, I think the figure is 94% of hash rate on Bitcoin flows through Chinese mining pools. Um, that can't happen as easily, at least in Monero. It, it could happen, but there's not a geographical or hardware restriction like there is with ASIC mining. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I just think it adds so much to the decentralized nature okay. of Monero and the permissionless nature. Anybody anywhere can opt in and start with the CPU, can opt into the network and get, get their yeah. hands on some Monero. You can't say that with Bitcoin. You can't, you know, you, you need other access to it. I mean, um, with Monero, you have a CPU, you could you could figure out how to get your hands on some Monero. And you could do that, for, you know, in perpetuity because of the tail emission. So there'll always be that option to yeah. essentially plug in uh, and mine and, and get some get some Monero. So to answer Robert Breedlove's question, what what is your your you know your short answer to that tweet that Poli put out? Is Monero sufficiently decentralized to survive um, a state level attack? That's a really hard question. I I responded to him there, and I I asked if he could define survive because I think that's really the key to that. Um, a state level attack would be incredibly destructive to even Bitcoin, in my opinion. I think there are a lot of ways that a, a state level attack against Bitcoin could destroy the majority of what people are interested in Bitcoin for, which is price, which is transactional stability, those kinds of things. Those those kinds of attacks are possible. A lot of that is what we've already talked about today. Um, those haven't happened yet. Hopefully they never happen. I don't want Bitcoin to die. I don't want any of these attacks to happen. Um, but I think those things are, are viable. So there could be a state level attack against Bitcoin, and I think it could be very effective. Um, I think my answer from my definition of survive would be yes and no. <laughs> um, I think Monero is very decentralized. I think it's probably the most decentralized project of any outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum, and where it ranks among those three is tricky to comment on. Um, I would say in a lot of ways, it's much more decentralized than Ethereum, but there's a lot of nuance there. Um, but a state level attack to a small community and a small project like this in relation to a state, I mean, this I'm not comparing it to another cryptocurrency project, but a state with infinite resources, um, it could be extremely destructive and it could destroy specifically price and any kind of accessible on-ramp to get into Monero from another source. So you're not going to be able to, if there's a state level attack, they're going to quickly shut down the on-ramps to where you can just take some cash, go buy Monero, or you can go to exchange and buy Monero. So in those ways, I think the easy accessibility of Monero could be destroyed. Um, but that's getting harder and harder every day. Um, I think RandomX is a, a huge part of the resilience of Monero in the case of an attack like that, because it's a way to acquire Monero in a trustless fashion that is very difficult to prevent, very difficult to detect if done through Tor, that kind of thing. Um, so I think in a lot of ways, it, it would survive in the sense that there would still be a network, there would still be people mining on the computers, 
and there would still be people transacting value. But obviously, it would it would suffer in comparison to what it would be without a state level attack. So that's a very complex discussion, though, and there's a lot of of nuance and specifics about what you mean by survive that that you'd have to kind of get into. Understood. Is can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a tough part. You know, like you said, would Bitcoin survive a state level? And we were talking about it, you know, just with the the uh, attacks that can be done on, uh, you know, mining farms. Um, yeah, so I, I, it, it just seemed like an unfair question to begin with. It's impossible to kind of really answer that in a fair way. How about uh, one of the things that, what are some of the, oh, did you watch the Zuko? Did you have a chance to watch that? Does you yeah, I, I skimmed through it, so I won't comment in depth because I didn't get to watch the tail end of it. But um, the the gist from for anybody who does take a look at that is he's describing what's known as an Eve Alice Eve attack or a poison output attack. This is something that we've been talking about in Monero for years now. Um, the breaking Monero episode that Serang Seray and Justin put out was. February 2019 on this. Um, and so it's something the Monero community is 100% aware of. We realize that there is a an issue when using a relatively small ring size and using decoys to protect the, the spender of funds. Um, but there are mitigations today, and that is churning. So if you're someone who is under this kind of duress and could be suspect to an, an evalacy attack, you can mitigate a lot of the potential for it by turning the outputs that you receive from suspicious entities. So like if you're running a store and you know 90% of the people who you buy who buy from you and they're people you know in real life, you know you don't have to worry about them. Maybe you don't want to you don't have to churn their their inputs. You don't worry about those. You spend them as you want. But you know, hey, I got 10 new customers this month and that's never happened before. I'm going to make sure that I take care of these funds. And it, it introduces a bit of complexity. It gets you a little bit more towards the difficulties that Bitcoin has with coin control and with coin join. Um, but basically, you would want to, at some random time interval, spend the funds to yourself, um, probably like two, three, four, five times. There's not, there's not very clear research on if this is happening, do these exact steps. Um, there's been some really good research on, um, I think it's under the Monero Research Lab repo. There's an issue about a few different ways to address this. And, and we've we've been thinking about this for a while, but um, there's not a immediate solution other than if you're worried about this, churn the outputs to yourself. It provides a lot of plausible deniability and makes it practically impossible for anyone to trace even through that, even when they're on both sides of the transaction. Um, but the future solution is increasing decoy count basically does what churning does today. And that's it increases the possible set of inputs and possible histories of inputs that you're hiding among. Um, so that'll likely come when we move to Triptych or maybe even when we move to Triptych or maybe even when we move, uh, if we do an interim fork to Bulletproofs Plus, that, that probably won't happen. But if that does happen, we'll probably do a, a ring size bump to help protect against um, specifically this type of attack, among others. But it's definitely it's a known attack. It's something Monero has done research into. We disclosed it. We have talked at length about the potential flaws, um, and we realize it's a problem. But it's important to note that it is not a problem for the vast majority of users. No one should go out and just start churning randomly. There's that's not helpful to most people. And even in this very specific scenario, it's hard to do churning in a way that's helpful. So. Um, most people don't need to worry about this. If you have very advanced threat models, there are mitigations that have been talked about at length in the Monero community that you can you can take. But um, we realize the issue, but we also realize we have a very specific set of uh, things that we want out of a privacy protocol. And right now, those are best met by the Monero protocol that we have in place. Someday, they, those may be met by a protocol similar to what Zcash does, even though, obviously, we would never go to it well, it has a trusted setup, and we would never do it not by default, like Zcash has for some reason kept going for years. Um, we would make sure that it was it was opt out, not opt in. So, I mean, Monero, we realize the flaws that we have. 
we're working on solutions. And when there's a good solution, we will figure out how to implement it and make it work. We are not Bitcoin. We're not we're not ossified. We haven't just frozen the protocol because we're going to make sure that we protect users well. Um, and right now, the Monero protocol protects everyone extremely well. Anyone can transact and get very good privacy guarantees. And vastly more people are transacting and gaining strong privacy on Monero than any other privacy coin and far more than Bitcoin as well. Um, so I think it's important to keep it in perspective. But yes, Monero is not perfect. If anyone tells you Monero is perfect, or if anyone tells you that their coin is perfect, they're lying or they just don't know. Because no digital tool, no software project is perfect. There will always be issues. And when money's involved, it's a lot more complex. So yeah. Oh, but then if people want to know more about that specific attack, there's a really good Breaking Monero episode. Uh, it's episode nine, and it's about poisoned outputs. And I can, I'll send you the link if you. Yeah, want I don't know. I, I think the Zuko video was kind of recent, I believe. So I don't know why he uh, he was kind of making it seem like there was this new thinking where he he's realized that you know Monero is is flawed uh, and cannot be fixed. Uh, when we we know Zcash, you know Zcash has its has its own issues um, with the trusted setup. Etc. What's your um? What's your take on this new Havino? I don't know if I'm saying it right. I just saw that. I have no idea how to pronounce it. I should probably have, figure that out. <laughs> be confused with Haven, right? With, yeah. Uh, uh, <sighs> what's your take on Haven? Let me let me hear. Let me let's hear that one as well. Have you have you been following that? Yeah, I'll, I'll really briefly mention Haven. Um, I think it's a it's a really interesting project. It's a Monero fork that's been around for a really long time. They went through some turmoil and died and then were kind of reborn by new devs who took it over. Um, they're doing something really interesting, which is that they took Monero's protocol. They took, I believe it's CLSAG as the, um, the form of Monero's protocol that is allowing them to do colored coins, which basically means that they can create synthetic assets within a Monero-like network um, to allow you to have things like stable coins, like synthetic gold, synthetic Bitcoin, that kind of thing. Um, it the the big big disclaimer is a it's a tiny project, so there's going to be very little code review, uh, any kind of audits, that kind of thing. Um, the other disclaimer is it relies on oracles. I am not convinced that the current oracle solutions within the cryptocurrency space are sufficient, but I am not an expert on that. So I'm not really going to comment past. I lean towards distrust in oracles uh, because if you want any of these synthetic assets, you have to get the, the value of the asset from somewhere. It's not something that can ever be native to the chain. So the way that they do that is through some sort of oracle that provides them with the price. Um, and then yeah, I guess those are really the main disclaimers. I, I think it's really fascinating, especially uh, fully private by default stablecoin is really cool. Um, the way that they've done it, which is that the actual supply of Haven fluctuates based on how people move in and out of synthetic assets um, is really interesting. So you don't have to collateralize to gain a synthetic asset. You just trade natively on chain to switch in and out. So. It's very interesting. I would definitely recommend people take a look at it. I would not recommend it for any kind of purpose that you trust your money in or that you trust your life in, nothing like that. Um, but I think it's a really cool way that some devs have taken the Monero protocol and found cool ways to to use it and still preserve privacy while kind of expanding the use case. So it's definitely interesting. I followed them for a very long time, talked with their lead devs quite a bit. Um, they're, they're really good people. They have a weird shill army on Twitter. If anyone runs into that, I'm sorry. I have no idea why that exists, but it does. So be forewarned. Um, but they to also make, have some really trying nice to make people. money, right? They're trying to pump pump that coin, small market cap, trying to pump yeah. it up. Um, which also, you speaking of people, you know, using the Monero code, we we didn't talk about Signal. So uh, you you put out an amazing thread on that, kind of like you broke down how you saw the whole thing. I think when it first came out. Uh, you were almost, I think, more excited about it. it was like your original tweet. I was looking. Yeah. Uh, excited that Signal was using uh, this this mobile coin. Um, but what have you settled at? Where where are you where are you at with uh, how things went down overall? You yeah. think it was a good good thing, bad thing for Signal? Yeah. Really briefly before we move on to that, I did want to mention Havana or 
Hey, yeah. you know, or however Definitely. you say it in Esperanto. I don't know how to pronounce things in Esperanto. Um, other than Monero, that's all I know. Um, but so Havano is a new project that has been created by some some devs who have contributed to Monero in the past. Um, it's taking BISC, which is a peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin trading platform. Um, it's taking that and forking it and basically making it a Monero first platform. Um, it's not going to be Monero only, most likely. It's it's I'm sure going to support Bitcoin, probably other um, cryptocurrencies in the long run. But it's essentially taking the model that BISC has, which is a peer-to-peer -peer trading platform, which is done entirely over Tor. So it's it's anonymous. Um, it has a lot of good privacy guarantees that way. And then it's replacing Bitcoin with Monero, which the main things that enables are nobody's leaking all of their data now. BISC was notorious because the transactions that they used in, tra in each transaction, in each trade that you did within BISC, it all happened on the Bitcoin blockchain, and they were extremely easy to see um, when there was a BISC transaction and what exactly happened. So now that we're switching to Monero, that will all be obscured. No one will be able to easily tell that you got the Monero from BISC, which is a problem right now which BISC, uh, with BISC. Um, so with Havano, it'll gain that property of Monero. It'll also gain reduced fees. I mean, fees in Bitcoin are nuts. And in a trustless system like this, you have to make multiple transactions. You have to use a multi-sig escrow account. Um, so there's a lot of transacting involved. And obviously within Bitcoin, that's it's super huge. expensive right now. Um, yeah, so why, why didn't we there. see BIS do that themselves? Why is it taking a, <laughs> a fork to do that? Yeah, I. a lot of people have proposed and even built solutions to make Monero more native to BISC. I mean, they were, at its core, it's built by people who are BTC, I don't know if I would say maximalists, I don't really know them that well. Um, but it's built by people who are very much Bitcoin first. And so... I don't think they were ever going to switch to allow Monero to be a, a base currency mm. within BISC. But even proposals to implement it as a native wallet or to implement better ways to trade it or tra ways to trade it against fiat currency, which one of the best things about BISC is you can trade fiat for Bitcoin and other currencies, or no, just Bitcoin. You can trade fiat for Bitcoin in a trustless manner. Um, so lots of these proposals have been made. I I put into an issue against the Havano um, repository. I put the the list of all of the proposals that have happened. All of them have been denied, none for a very good reason that I could find. Um, and basically, we've done everything possible to try to get Monero as a more more of a main player within BISC because anywhere between 50 to 80 percent of the volume on BISC is Monero. It's XMR BTC trading back and forth a lot. So it's been a huge driver for the volume of BISC for a long time. So we've been trying to get better support for it within there, but those attempts have failed. So now, after many attempts, forking it off and making it Monero first is going to be, I think, a much better solution. Um, the really important thing for people to know is it's going to be able to be used for trading fiat for Monero. So it's going to kind of be like local Monero, but there will be a more trustless system for handling the escrow. Um, and it'll allow you to do it in some different ways. It, there's definitely a lot of crossover there. But the other cool thing is they've already mentioned that they're going to want to integrate atomic swaps natively within it. Um, so if you want to go from XMR to BTC, you'll be able to do it with atomic swaps all within the same client. Um, so just having a central place that is very much Monero first and focused on the needs of the Monero community and being able to trade both fiat and Bitcoin and I'm sure other currencies in the future, um, all in a way that is anonymous and trustless and peer to peer is a very powerful thing and very necessary. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited. It's, it's something that I, I didn't see coming. I had no idea it was being built. Um, and I'm very excited for. Yeah. How far out do we think that is? I mean, uh, it's, this hasn't been built yet, right? This is something that's being proposed, essentially, right? The code base has been forked, and some changes have been made, um, but it's very much in the in the early stages. So, I, I again, I, I wasn't behind the creation of this, and I just learned about it, so I don't want to comment on timeframes. Mm -hmm. um, I would say probably will be a little bit. I mean, obviously, atomic swaps aren't out yet for mainnet, so that portion definitely isn't coming right away. Um, but hopefully sooner rather than later. And if if you're listening to this or watching this and you're interested, the main things that are needed are if you're a dev, I think the core language that's being used is Java. So if you're interested, 
go ahead and hop into the Matrix IRC channel. I think it's Haveno-dev or Haveno. Um, and if you want to donate funds, obviously funding is going to be vital. So you can already go ahead and donate at their, their GitHub repo. Um, there's some funds their way. Make sure that this becomes a reality. I would assume they'll open a, a CCS request as well for funding, but um, I don't think that's been decided on yet. So, yeah. Yeah, this is a nice little surprise to see. I don't think uh, yeah. I, I knew. I had no idea that that was being worked on. Um, is is you know if, is the BTC to Monero pair still the main pair on on Bisk? Is it? Yeah. Let me see real quick. If I can pull that up real quick. Um, the times that I've looked over the past year or so, uh, it's been vastly driven by Monero. Because, yeah, I know the volume on that was quite high at some point, and then it died down. Yeah, it was like 80 to 90% of the volume that was happening. Um, I think it's dropped to like 50 to 60%, and it, it vacillates a lot. Um, right now it looks like, uh, this could not be, this might not be right. I don't know. Coinpeprika.com says that 26% of the overall volume is XMR BTC and all of the other main pairs are Bitcoin and fiat. Um, again, only Bitcoin can go to and from fiat within BISC. So there's no mm. way to do Monero to fiat, but I know that that's, it's been the dominant driver for volume for a very long time for them. Okay. So yeah, the uh, the signal thing, man. What's uh, yeah. what's your final kind of your final conclusion there? Are you, yeah. are you still recommending signal as as your as what people should use to communicate privately? Um, I'm not jumping ship yet. I I don't think that this necessarily means that it's not a good tool to use for communicating privately. Um, it certainly has shaken up my trust in them because. After looking into this, it does not seem like there's any, there's not a good reason. There are not good reasons behind this move. Um, and so it's, it's definitely shaken some trust in them. The most frustrating part, and I, a lot of people have voiced this on Twitter and other places, is that a lot of us, myself included, have spent a lot of time and effort and social capital getting our friends and family to move on to Signal because it was a good, trustworthy, open source, private by default chat platform. Um, it was very easy to migrate to, especially in the US. It does SMS and encrypted chat. So it's very easy for people to slowly onboard onto. So I've spent a lot of time getting people on Signal. Um, so it's extremely frustrating as someone who's done that to see that they've chosen to make a very poor choice. And I hesitate to say that it's entirely a cash grab, but they could have very simply integrated many existing cryptocurrencies. Obviously, I think Monero would have been an excellent fit. And funnily enough, they essentially chose to take the Monero protocol and build it on top of what is essentially the Stellar consensus model. Um, I haven't kept up with Stellar for a very long time because I have no interest in that. But um, it's essentially Monero on top of the Stellar consensus model with some trusted compute from Intel mixed in, um, which that's fine. I don't have massive issues with that. Obviously, I disagree with the trust models there. I wouldn't ever want to use that personally, but that would be an OK trade off. I would disagree, but I could understand that. The, the core issue is the coin is 100% pre-mined. There is no fair issuance. No one can mine it. No one can acquire it any way other than buying it from the founders or the VCs that backed MobileCoin, um, which whenever there's 100% pre-mine, it never means anything good because they very well could have issued this in a way that allowed mining, that allowed even if they wanted to go proof of stake. Again, I am not sure pure proof of stake works well, but they could have done that and incentivized people to validate and decentralize the network. Instead, they chose to 100% pre-mine it. They did a pre-sale already for supposedly 80 cents and it's already like $65 per coin. So everyone who got in early did very well by intentionally hiding the fact that this was coming. Um, there have been some rumblings that mobile coin was gonna be what was integrated into Signal, but nothing concrete. And now we've learned that Signal essentially withheld their server source code for a while, most likely to disguise the fact that they were integrating mobile coin. Um, 
which again is, I don't know, that point alone makes me want to touch signal. I'm, I'm very much on the fence. I'll probably take it down as a recommendation for my blog soon as I kind of think through and process this. Um, but yeah, it's essentially, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting technical approach. It's one that I completely disagree with the trust models. Um, mobile coin on its own, if it had fair issuance and everything, I would probably come to be fine with. And it would even be cool if it continued to iterate the Monero protocol and somehow gave back to Monero, helped the tech or donated, something like that. That was my initial reaction was, oh, this is really cool. They used the Monero protocol and they, yeah, they changed out consensus, but like, that's okay. I understand it. I don't like it, but whatever. Um, and then I essentially just walked through the documentation that they had, walked through some of the code they had, walked through the white paper, because um, I was curious to learn more. And the farther down the rabbit hole I went, the more disgusted and sad I was at, at the approaches that have been taken. Um, and I, I think it's kind of sad, kind of funny, but that is by far my most popular tweet of all time. Yeah. Um, far more than any Monero thread that I've ever made or anything like that. Um, but I think it it was timely because there wasn't a lot of info in a single place. It was really hard going through MobileCoin's documentation and information to figure out like, like they specifically said in multiple places, the current supply is unknown and we're not gonna tell you. And like max supply was visible, but then the pre-mine was a little hazy on how it was done. But then like I found in the white paper, the Genesis block contained 16 outputs, which contain 100% of the max supply of MobileCoin. Um, so like a lot of the stuff they're not necessarily hiding intentionally, but it was very hard to find the answers to what should have been clear questions. Um, and I think no one had really kind of walked through all of that and put it into a single place. So as I was kind of learning and reading through and figuring out what was going on, I made that thread and obviously it, it took off a lot more than anything else I've put out has. So I think a lot of people were were upset. And I think interesting, interestingly, they managed to piss off both the crypto cryptocurrency communities at large, and they managed to piss off the privacy communities at large, a lot of whom are still not convinced their cryptocurrency is even a, a good thing. And so now they pissed up both communities and they've entrenched in the mind of a lot of privacy communities, cryptocurrency is just a scam. So a lot of those people are gonna miss out on real projects like Monero. And they've pissed off a lot of cryptocurrency people, a lot of whom are now gonna become Bitcoin maximalists or whatever, because they see, look, even this Monero protocol has been used in a scam. Like it just just go Bitcoin only, that's all you need to do. Um, so it's gonna, it's gonna stop a lot of people from finding Monero and other valuable tools. And it very well could be at least the end of a lot of people recommending Signal. I'm not gonna go out and say that as a protocol, it's flawed or that you shouldn't use Signal. I, I don't, I wouldn't think that today, but I think it, it's a very bad sign that this was done. Um, the technical approach is interesting if personally I think it's flawed, but the ethical approach is just, it's a nightmare. I mean, even like the, the CEO of MobileCoin, which anytime there's a CEO of a cryptocurrency, ask yourself a couple questions. But the CEO of MobileCoin, his response was initially, we created MobileCoin to fund Signal, that's it. Um, and yeah, that's just, there are a lot of other ways you can fund a nonprofit um, and funding it by selling your coins for a lot of money to unsuspecting uh, regular investors is uh, not a great look and not something that puts a lot of faith in Signal. So hopefully they'll bail on this, they'll step back and they'll reassess and change their minds, but I doubt it. I, oh yeah, I don't think you think they would, they're even considering that? That would be interesting no. if they did that. Yeah. I like to think that they're listening to the community and reassessing, but no, there's way too much money in it. Do you think uh, ultimately, you know, we need a product like that, something that combines, you know, secure private messaging with the ability to transact privately? Um, I think a lot of people, I, initially, I would have said yes, um, but I've seen a lot of people just make the comment that there's not, there's not really a lot of good that comes from combining a payments platform and a chat platform. Um, not only because it muddies the waters as far as metadata leakage, because if you're using this to transact and chat, there are more angles that your identity could be leaked or information could be leaked. So there could be issues there. Um, the other problem is things like this can happen where what was focused solely on chat 
now they have this alternate angle and they end up trying to use it to fund themselves or they focus on that and the chat features fall apart. You can have issues like that. Um, but I think a lot of people have made the good point that you don't really need a native integration. I mean, like if I want to transact in Monero right now, I do it all the time by texting people a sub address in Signal. They copy and paste it. They're done. I mean, I would love for it to be like I press a button and I say how much Monero and it sends directly right. to that person. But I mean, we could even potentially come up with a solution like that. I mean, Open Alias is a nice solution that Monero's had for a really long time where you can create a DNS record that is like, like I have one, I I need to update it because it's it's not to a domain I use anymore, but you can have like Seth at SethSimmons.me. And if someone puts that into their Monero wallet, it will send to the right address. Um, so there's solutions like that. I mean, Monero is especially a better fit for that type of use case because you don't have to worry about um, address reuse as much. You don't have to generate new addresses every time. If you're transacting with the same person, just give them the same address. They don't gain any extra visibility. Um, so I think probably the best long-term path is just keep those things separate, keep building really good chat platforms, keep building really good payment platforms. And as long as we have simple ways to connect the two, like copying and pasting addresses, or maybe just having dynamic links where if you press the link, it opens your your uh, cake wallet or your Monero Joe wallet and populates all the information. That's plenty. I mean, that, that's enough for most people to make it simple. So. Agreed. Yeah. yeah, that's that's what I was arriving at as well. As you think think about this deeper, uh, we'll we'll wrap it up here. I I asked you I asked you a lot of questions. I'm going to ask you so one more just to 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 leave it off here. Yeah. Um, you did a blog also on how people can contribute to Monero. Mm -hmm. So since you have this platform here, we'd love for you to you know maybe say a few things. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there watching this that are. You know, maybe more on the noob side. They've discovered Monero, but they're thinking, "What could I? What could I even do to possibly help?" I'm not necessarily a coder. What What are your recommendations? How can people help out? Yeah, I'll definitely. If you want to throw them in the show notes, that'd be great. Um, yeah. But the the main thing I would say is, I know that most people who are entering the space are not going to be developers. Um, so for those people who are not developers, I know it can be daunting at times coming into a project like this. You know, you, you fall in love, you love it, you love using it, but how are you supposed to actually help out? The simplest way is just be engaged in the community. Um, be active on Reddit, jump into Matrix and join the chats to help us make decisions about the future of Monero, to help us just get to know each other, to build stronger community. Um, just having input for more people is incredibly valuable. So if the least you can do is just stay active on social media and Matrix, that's incredibly helpful. It helps to grow the community. It helps to bring other people in. It helps to educate new people. Um, there's a lot of opportunities there. And I mean, as someone who is not natively a developer, the vast majority of the ways that I'm helping out Monero are in staying involved, staying engaged in critical conversations. I try to stay active in like the Monero Research Lab channels. And I try to be a part of dev meetings and community meetings and just be a voice, be a be a perspective um, and help out that way. So that's probably the easiest way to get involved. Um, outside of that, for non-developers, the other main approaches are you can help out with translations. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Again, all this is linked in the blog post, so it's probably the easiest way to find it. Um, but helping out with translations into your native language would be excellent. The more people who can access Monero in their own native language, the better. That's a huge, huge part. That's, I think, a, a piece of open source contributions that often goes unnoticed is how important translations are. Um, so that's really big. And then the other one is obviously donating. So Monero has no community. I mean, no, it does have a community. It has no company behind it. Um, there's no dev tax that's constantly taking part of the, the block reward to, to stow away. There's no um, central entity that's funding things. So the way that Monero continues to thrive, continues to survive, continues to grow, and continues to employ brilliant people to work on it is through donations. Um, so ccs.getmonero.org, you can go there. Any requests that are currently open for funding, you can throw some Monero their way. Um, obviously, there's no pressure to donate to any specific thing. You donate to what you want to see happen. Don't donate to things you don't like. Um, that's part of the beauty. It is completely a voluntary system. Um, but donations are definitely huge. We're definitely going to have some requests 
coming up soon. I know there's quite a few in the pipeline, so be ready for that. Um, any anything helps. Don't feel like you have to donate 10 Monero or 100 Monero. Like I I would just love to see honestly see the contributors list be a thousand people contributed and we're only at 10 Monero total. That would be so awesome to see. I would much rather see that than see five people contributed and we we met the goal of 120 Monero. Um, not that I don't want those whales donating obviously please continue it's been super helpful but i just want to see the community who are actively donating grow because i think that's a great sign of the kind of the heart of the community um so I'd that's love to a very see good that. point yeah uh i should you know we should trust that more on this show as well yeah i mean it's not you know if you don't have to donate one whole monero you know <laughs> you don't have to even donate 10 bucks just the fees are so low throw a dollar at a right. project if, if you maybe only have 50 dollars of monero yeah. awesome throw a little bit of plus, it towards there. Plus now you're experiencing Monero, you're using it. So yeah, there's all yeah. the reason in the world to do it. Uh, yeah, great points. I mean, really at the end of the day, I mean, yeah, the, I, the most important thing, because I think a lot of, especially noobs, they look at it, they're looking at Monero and they're wondering, oh my God, uh, will this thing succeed? They're thinking about it, sounds great in theory. What they have to realize is, you know, they're they're part of, um, you know, the the, they're going to decide whether it succeeds or not. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if yeah. they want it to succeed, just start using it, start telling other people about it. I mean, like we were saying, the network effects, I mean, that's probably the biggest thing Monero has up against going up against it right now mm -hmm. is that, you know, Bitcoin is pulling all the oxygen out of the room. So, I mean, if you want to make sure Monero succeeds, use it, tell other people to use it. Yeah. And just just spread the word. I mean, that's probably more of, more important than anything else right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something. If you're completely non-technical, if you have no idea how to do anything other than open Cake Wallet and transact to Monero, first, that's awesome that you're part of Monero that you're using it. That's what it's for. It's to be used. So great. But you can still contribute in that very simple way. Just tell people about it. Donate to the community. Get involved in chat. Or like something I've been kind of cataloging lately is a lot of free open source projects and a lot of privacy projects are coming around to the beauty of accepting donations in Monero. So another way that you can help to grow both the, communi the Monero community and the network effect of Monero is supporting the projects that you love that aren't Monero with Monero. I mean, it's, it's an mm -hmm. excellent tool for that. It's so simple because the person who wants to receive donations, they put their address in GitHub or on their website or they tweet it out and they don't have to worry about generating a new address for each person or anything like that. They post that out, everybody can donate what they want to. It's private by default, protects the donor and the recipient, and it's just a great way to support those projects you love. So if you have projects you love that accept Monero for donations, donate that way. Um, if you have projects you love that don't accept Monero for donations, just go ahead and message them and ask, hey, like I'd love to send you some money. I don't feel comfortable using Patreon or whatever the other platforms are. Um, but hey, Monero is here. This is how you can use it. This is how you can get set up. Install Cake Wallet, send me your address, and I'll donate to you. I mean, something like that could be a, a great way to get other people involved. Um, and I've recently seen some privacy communities start to come around to Monero because of that, which is awesome. So um, there, there's, I mean, there's so many ways. There's a lot more than that in the blog post. There's a lot more than that in on Reddit. I think there's a pinned post right now that has tons of information. Um, on r slash Monero about how you can contribute and get involved. So there's tons of ways. If you're non-technical, please don't feel like there's not a place for you. Um, even if it's just to come chat and hang out, the Monero community is incredibly welcoming, incredibly well-informed, very open to critical discussion. We are not generally, I mean, some people are obviously, but we're not generally closed-minded or against hard discussions about the technical aspects or use cases of Monero. Um, so jump in, chat, donate contribute how you can, um, or just use it. You don't have to do anything. If you don't want to do anything, just use it, enjoy the benefits, <laughs> profit from what other people are doing. That's fine too. Great points, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Glad I finally got you on here. Yeah. I'm Sorry sure I've been I... so crazy busy. Glad glad we're able to get this worked out. Yeah. Stop in uh, Monerotopia when you can, you know, pop yeah. in. Sure people would love to see you there as well. Uh, do you want to tell people where they can find you? Where, um, you know, maybe mention your blog, your Twitter. Yeah, sure. Um, probably the best place to find me. I mean, the place I'm most active is either Twitter or Matrix. Um, Twitter, just at Seth I. Simmons on there. Matrix, I'm at, at Seth Simmons, semicolon, Monero.social. It's kind of harder to 
get connected there. But if you go to my blog, which is just sethsimmons.me, um, obviously I have lots of posts there. I have guides to help you set up a node and among other things. But if you go to the About Me tab, um, all my different contact methods from simple things to advanced things like PGP are all there. Um, so if you want to reach out, do it that way. If you want to follow me, again, I'm most active on Twitter. So at Seth I. Simmons on there. Highly recommend following him on Twitter. You're, you're on top of it. <laughs> Thank you, Seth. Appreciate it. Thanks, Doug. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.